All right, welcome once again to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. And today's white lightning will be courtesy of Mr. Robert Jordan, the late great. Uh, we are going to start our discussion of the books. Um, I am going to refer back to the uh, series from time to time, partly because uh, it's fresh in everyone's memory and partly because we had a lot of commenters saying they hadn't read the books yet. And after starting the series, they wanted to read the series. And so we're going to go through. Well, let's do uh, an official spoiler alert. So this, uh, this is more specific to the books. So we refrain from giving too much away in our talk of the series about mm -hmm. the books, uh, other than a little bit of bitching and moaning that it didn't go along with it, not giving specifics from the book. But now yeah. we are going to talk specifically from the books. And yeah. so this is spoiler alert for, for both the books and the series if you're right. catching these first few seconds. So I, I can't think of any way to make this not heavily spoilery. So well, we're, we're going right through it as we read it. Yep. So it's yep. it, it, we're going through it as we read it. Uh, we will make sure to, uh, in the title or description, say what chapters we're covering. So you know that, you know, if you've read up to whatever chapters we're on, we're not going to spoil anything for you beyond that. And you said this is uh, and, a, a possibly going through seven today. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see how long this takes since this is our first one. Um, but I'm thinking it's going to be about the first seven chapters. Uh, we may go longer if that doesn't take too long. And okay. Official disclaimers. Heath is going through the books right now. I yep. read the books recently, but again, it's about a year to get through all 14 of them if you read at my pace so that was about a year and a half ago yeah. so it's relatively fresh but at the same time i've got 14 books of information in my head versus he's got mm -hmm. the first seven chapters fresh <laughs> and so. and they do get longer and longer as the series goes <laughs> well and more complex oh yeah yeah he that, that's something we'll get into right away that's in a lot of my notes is how jordan builds okay so he keeps layering things okay He's, he's making a layer cake that just gets more and more complex as he goes. Um, and with, with character introductions and world buildings and all these things. So uh, that's why there is a has long been a very healthy discussion community online, um, because it sometimes takes a lot of brains. In fact, he had one full time assistant or two full time assistants. I can't remember. Plus his wife, who was his editor, that helped him keep track of his ludicrous amounts of notes uh, so that he wouldn't contradict things. And so that he would remember to, you know, socky back and, and tie things up where, where, mm -hmm. and when he wanted to. When I think sometimes there were some, I remember when I finally finished the series, I was like, well, what happened with this whole plot line and what happened with this one? There were some loose ends that were kind of left yeah. open. Uh, yeah. And it's that, that'll be something curious to talk about as we get towards the end of the series, because my thinking was, I think a lot of that was on purpose because I remember him saying some things towards the end of his life in, uh, uh, in discussions and book signings and whatnot is that um, life doesn't always have a happy ending and life isn't always neatly wrapped up. Mm -hmm. So well, and it's really uh, I got the impression that there were going to be some things. Yeah, yeah it, makes it, it makes it tough because it also had a different author in the end. Mm -hmm. And there mm -hmm. might have been some mental notes that weren't put down or or even the organization of it just not in a way that yeah. was clear where he was going because it did seem like in the last book there were a few characters and a few plot lines that were like oh there that guy is again and now he's dead yep and yep 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 he's like oh okay that was that was a, a bit of a letdown <laughs> to the very end but starting with the very beginning it's not a letdown um i I won't spend too much time on the prologue because I brought it up during our discussions because I think it is so good. It's such a good example of, of how to set the stage. So the, the prologue opens with, uh, with, a, with a rather bizarre scene and you don't know what's going on. And in fact, I'm not going to say what's going on because you don't really find out till what would you say, like halfway through the series, exactly mm -hmm. what was going on in that scene. Um, so it takes a while of unraveling and, and slow reveals before you know exactly what's going on in this scene. But, <clears throat> and when I first read it, I remember 
rereading sections several times because I would go, wait, what was that? But it, it's not because it's poorly written or confusingly written. It's simply because you don't know don't the know mechanics of what's is. going on. Yeah. You don't know who these characters are. You Which, know, who, if we circle to the series, why didn't we start with this? Because mm -hmm. we got mm -hmm. that scene at the beginning of the last episode. Yeah, I still have my problems about how the argument went down between the two. But at the same time, it wouldn't have been just seeming like it was just plugged in there because you would have recognized yeah. that face from maybe the prologue of the original episode. And you're like, oh, that's who that is. And so that would have yeah. that would have made some continuity there. Otherwise, to, to our kind of critique, it was just thrown in front of you to give you an information dump. Yeah. And and you've got. You've got some name drops here of Luz there and Telemann, Ilyana, and and you're not going to know who these people are for a while, um, but it, it's dropping you right into some action. I mean, this is this is the opening of Star Wars with, you know, the 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 scroll across, and then all of a sudden you've got spaceships chasing after each other, shooting lasers. It's it's really pulling you into some action right away that you you know something big and epic is happening here it's a, it's a very good establishment of an epic um the the opening of the of the fellowship of the ring movie is another good example of uh, uh, of how <clears throat> how this can be used so well yeah why don't you go ahead and uh just go on into the uh the first chapter then yep so there, yeah, because there's, there's not a lot to talk about in the prologue there without giving things away. Uh, yeah, well, what I was looking for is if they used a person's real name or the one mm -hmm, he was given by mm -hmm. people. and They, they, they use just call name. him Betrayer of Hope. Well, no, they? they use his real name. Uh, okay. Well, you won't know it from watching the show, so it's not a spoiler. Elan Morin. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That is something that takes a long time to reveal. Uh-huh. Uh, you have to put some things together later on. Um, so you, you get some names there that are just going to kind of worm in the back of your mind as you read here. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the first chapter, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have minded if they wanted to hold off on the uh, the Age of Wonders stuff and that prologue and mm -hmm. jump right to the first chapter, because I, I think this is also a great opening. So the the prologue is a great teaser and now the movie's starting mm -hmm. uh because uh you're you're setting the scene um immediately with with not just the the descriptions of the geography and na and the nature around them but through rand's thinking you're, you're setting the stage right away for what the two rivers is and who its people are mm -hmm. um it also gives you a glimpse you know because this is a fantasy setting so it's letting you know right away there's something unnatural going on mm -hmm. uh winter is hanging on way too long animals are behaving oddly um and and so it it's it's letting you know right off the bat there's something weird going on here but here you have just two normal people living their life to to just farmers and shepherds who don't really know they're just they're just observing from afar what this unnaturalness is so you the reader aren't going to get any clues yet as to what that is yeah i would still, um i would still fight that the the uh having the original prologue would have added mm -hmm. some depth because then then you would gone through that that intense scene and then it would just be all of a sudden a little farm life and you're you're mentally resetting to, whoa, how are we going to get to wherever that was? Yeah. Is that is that past? Is that future? What's going on there? And now yeah. all of a sudden we're in this we're in this, this nice little idyllic, you know, almost almost fantasy painting type of thing, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know actually, uh, it's been a long time since I read the original Lord of the Rings. I almost feel like Peter Jackson took a note from Jordan on the way he did the movie, having those cut hmm. scenes right in the beginning that you then, yeah. then going to the Shire and you're like, Whoa, yeah, how does yeah. that fit? It's almost like, yeah. I don't remember that, that, that being in the original books of the Lord of the Rings. And it's it, almost it's like he took to the note from Jordan 
and it's like hey if we do this we can have a yeah. compelling that 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 prologue to the movie is something uh, as best as i can recall that's something you find out later when elrond is talking mm -hmm. uh, and he's telling the story of that day mm -hmm. um so i i do do wonder uh if if jackson is a jordan fan and if he consciously or subconsciously borrowed that idea because it is it is a sharp contrast between mm -hmm. you know this this pastoral setting of the shire and this incredibly dark and gritty battle scene here and you get another sharp contrast here in the first chapter which i like well first of all like th this whole all, all, all of this first section that I'm talking about is in my mind, episode one of a series. And it's mm -hmm. very slow because if you take your time at the beginning, measure twice, cut once. If you take your time at the beginning to have some slowness, then you can establish things and you can pull the audience in. You can also lull them to sleep a little bit. Mm -hmm. So this, this opening scene that's all in Rand's head could very easily be done as a conversation between Rand and Tam. Mm -hmm. And you could get a lot of that information out. But then all of a sudden, this what seems like a boring, dreary, late winter, early spring day is all of a sudden cut off with this creepy suspension and a little bit of action of seeing the Black Rider. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, uh, Rand is unnerved by it. Uh, his father kind of has feels like something might be wrong and you get a little sense here this is the very beginning of a sense that tam is more than he seems with the way he acts uh which i really like and then and then you get another reinforcement of something unnatural is going on here mm -hmm. when as you ranted about with that last episode of the series is rand realizes it's a blustery late winter day and the writer's cloak did not move mm -hmm. at all it was just dead still well, I think something else important, too, with the, the relationship with Rand and Tam was Tam never saw the writer. Only Rand did. Uh -huh. but, but you could, again, tell there was more to Tam because not only did he take his son's word for it, even though he didn't see a single thing, he trusted Rand that much. But also you could tell by this scene that he somehow, he, 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 he even though he's a lowly farmer in the two rivers, knew what the cloak that didn't move meant and that that gives you a little depth that you don't get the first time you read it because you don't even know what it means but but then if you do a reread you're like oh yeah tam knew what that was yeah there, there's a lot of stuff that jumped out at me partly because it's been so long since i read it and partly because i'm reading it differently now because i, I set out with the idea of I want to reread and talk about why the book works, how it works and why it works so well. So I'm, I'm, I'm reading it less as a um, story interest and story critique and more as a literary critique. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there are a lot of things about how Jordan sets things up. Cause if, if you're just reading it for the joy of reading it, you're going to get right off the bat, how complex jordan's stories are how complex his narrative is and how how good he is it's, it's the meme of what's that always sunny in philadelphia with the guy at the crazy board with all the red yarn connecting mm -hmm. everything and that's jordan as he as he gets deeper and deeper into the story um but when you reread it uh after the fact then you can really see a lot of the things that he's setting up uh for instance the next the next scene is getting into the village which is just glossed over in the in the show but he takes his time here to set this up and i this is why it's important because he sets the stage right off the bat of how hardy and stubborn two rivers folk are and that's important because heroes don't just come from nowhere mm -hmm. and you, you know you're reading a heroic tale just because of the genre and the setup. And now he's cluing you in that these are people who can be heroes. And if you look back even at history, even at our own heroes like Sergeant York or Major Winners or those kind of people, you'll, you'll see that they came from some adversity. They came from 
you know, something uh, hardier and tougher than normal that, uh, that forged them so that they could withstand what was going to come next, even though they had no idea what was going to come next. Um, but they were able to withstand it. Well, again, it's um, character development too, because it, it is the traits that they're pulling out of this first uh, chapter and the first, the beginning of this book that, you know, you could say, well, you're a stubborn little kid or you're a country bumpkin uh-huh. or all these things. And then uh, they end up being important for exactly where, why he was the right man for the job or, yeah. Uh, or, or something uh, else along those lines. Why, why Matt's the way he is, why Perrin does the things he does. Yeah. Uh, as, as it says on page seven, that was the way of most two rivers people, people who had to watch the hail beat their crops or the wolves take their lambs and start over no matter how many years it happened, did not give up easily. Most of those who did were long since gone. So it's, it sets the stage for what's to come so that so that everything flows and makes narrative sense uh and also that it has emotional payoff so when when you see these normal people starting to become heroes like you know with the with the hobbits in the lord of the rings when you see where they come from and then when you see them start to be do things that are truly heroic it has more emotional payoff because you've planted the seed there Mm -hmm. earlier and then something about uh, it's been a long time it was when i it was one of the things that got me to reread the books and it's it was i'm scrolling back because i quoted somebody and it was about reading books at different points in your life mm. you, you keep going well I'm, i should be so the very next page now we've, we've set the scene for these people and how they have it within them to do heroic things even though they come from very normal backgrounds, but it's, it's because they've had to live a hardy life. And then the very next page, he's setting things up in a broader context that I don't know that I've ever noticed before being set up from the very beginning, uh, which is uh, he's planting that first seed of gender roles and politics which, which will really grow into a major undercurrent of the whole series mm-hmm. uh, in large part because of, as we've talked about in the series and you saw in the series, is that you have, you have two halves of the power, the, the magic of this world, and men and women wield them differently. And so he, he's already planting this seed, and I don't know that I'd ever seen it because it, it comes off as just kind of a bit of comic relief because... Here you have a, a, a cranky old ne'er do well, um, one of the Congers demanding that that Tam, one of the village council, do something about the wisdom. And Tam's it's that's women's circle business. It's none of mm-hmm. ours. And then here comes Conger's wife to read him the riot act, and Tam has to very deftly and quietly get out of the way before she grabs hold of him because she's quite the she bull in a china shop. Mm-hmm. built like one too let's see i think i just found it ah that's who it was okay so I, I, this quote from uh dave tate he's actually a well-known strength coach but uh he uh he said that you should read books again not be, be- because the book is different but because you are a different person Oh yeah, I think when you, you brought read that it up again, yeah, several months back, yeah. So, so that that was actually the the quote that inspired me to hey, you know what, I need to read this again, but also I need to finish it. So let's do this now. And it I was a completely different person. I mean, I was a fourteen year old kid when I or twelve year somewhere on 12, 13, 14 year old kid when I started, and then I stopped for about fifteen years and then came back at it as a pushing forty year old guy. So little bit of life experience having a kid and working jobs and owning a business and all of those things um so now we get to the end of the chapter and this this long section here page 13 to 18 is is not just introducing new characters but it's also 
the beginnings of the plot unfolding, the main plot unfolding. So you see that this black writer that Rand saw isn't, he's something bigger than just a lone boogeyman on an empty road because other kids have seen him mm -hmm. quite a few others actually. Um, so again, something unnatural is going on. Something bigger than what it seems is going on here. But of course you, the reader first time through, you are as clueless as mm -hmm. the characters, which is one of the, great things about the way that Jordan writes writing from a character perspective is the, the, the reader only has as much knowledge as the characters, which, uh, which adds to the suspense as well as pulling you into the story more because you're identifying with this character more. Than, well, and, than and it had a lot of more, it had a lot of depth to it too. Uh -huh. So, so, you know, these kids that were already friends and doing stuff together had this uncomfortable conversation where none of them wanted to bring it up, but finally someone's like, well, I saw this. Okay. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to bring it up first, but me too. And so-and-so said they saw it too. And then oh. you're also pulling in that portion of the story that about their age and how, uh, when they mm. were born and how close they were together in age and, and uh, that you're also, of... you're also establishing character traits just right off the mm -hmm. bat. Right off the bat, Matt is established as a, a prankster with a boyish sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and and Rand is ha, has this duality, this constant tug of war within himself of self and duty. Mm -hmm. That he 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 feels obligated to do the right thing. He he feels obligated to do what he's supposed to do. But also, uh, a and, chink and in even his Matt, armor when it comes to Matt being able yes. to pull him into being yeah. able to pull him into shenanigans. Mm -hmm. But then also Matt is, he, he doesn't sneak off. He doesn't run away as much as he wants to. He helps his friend with his chores. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so ultimately, even though he's going to resist it the most, Matt is also going to do what he's supposed to do. He's also going to help his friend. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, and it, it, it plays to that, 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 uh, kind of, well, I'm going to say old school because it, it's, it's well past medieval times. We just, it just seems so far away from the way things are now since Disney took hold of how kids should act, but that respect for your elders as much as he was a goofball and wanted to play around soon as Tam's like, you're going to help. Right. He's like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he did it. Yeah. You're, you're. You're coming from a very the, the the two rivers is very old fashioned, and you mm -hmm. you establish very quickly here within a, a couple of chapters that old fashioned or in the eyes of people from the outside backwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is a, another uh, core trait of not just the region but the people from the region, mm -hmm. which is going to carry through the whole series. Um, a, a, another great thing about that we're going to get into as we get into chapter two here right away uh, is is it Jordan's mechanism of perspective is also a great way to show don't tell. Mm -hmm. So just just think about how boring it got when they would have these exposition jumps in the series or any show that you've watched where there's just an exposition dump and it's boring. Um, you're you're it, it becomes a popcorn movie it becomes something you have on in the background to be mildly entertaining while you're doing chores it's it's not something you watch and really get invested in mm -hmm. um and and you get this really well with the introduction of moraine because you you never it's a long way time before we see moraine's perspective where we mm -hmm. get a chapter from moraine's perspective so her introduction is, is showing not telling by necessity because you're getting, you're getting her description, uh, perceptions and interactions all from other people. So this is what, this is what the villagers, especially the youthful villagers see and think when they see Moraine and when they interact with her. Mm -hmm. um, so you get, you you really get her 
character without knowing her character Mm -hmm. because so much of her character is how she carries herself well and this is this is the interactions which i think would have changed a lot when it came to the adaptation because it could have created a moment you could have without adding a lot of screen time or or play uh just with the coin scenes where she hires them for jobs and gives them a coin and it would have helped explain a lot of things that just made no sense in the show because she could have she could have used that i know they're alive Mm -hmm. which we're probably going to get to here soon in the books which was missing from the show and it was it was almost like she had less of a plan in the show even though she was supposed to be the center of attention in the beginning yeah than she did in the books and when you're talking depth in a, in a character, yeah, some cool CG and her doing magic right in the beginning was fine. I understand why they did that scene, but there was no depth to it. And when you try to have stuff later, it, the, without that build along the way, it was just, wasn't very convincing. And whereas in the book, yeah. in the book, it's, it's these little things she does. And then it comes out to be something important as it comes up and you're like, Holy shit, she was doing this. And and because they're telling you, not showing you. So Mm -hmm. they try and rectify it when they get to the White Tower in the series with with all with other Aes Sedai talking about how smart she is and what a schemer she is, Mm -hmm. especially the leader of the Blues who who needs Moraine there in the tower to help her. So they're telling you all this, but they haven't shown it to you Mm -hmm. with with the with the way she has conducted her mission there. And it's kind of turned into a debacle. Uh, and and in the in the series, or in the in the book, as we'll get to, it it does kind of turn into a debacle. But she's never out of control. Mm-hmm. She always has contingencies, and she's always thinking ahead. Which gives me, which is a beef that I had that I didn't bring up in the the series uh, videos when they. Let me say this: This is. A, we'll, are we going to get to Shatter Lugoth today? No, no, because it was the neutering of Rand. It was Rand's fault they went there in the show. Yeah, and where Moiraine was the decision maker here. So we'll 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 shelf that for now. Uh, yeah, and I'll rant. So on that. remind me to rant on that when we get that far. Great cup, great sentence here about Moiraine. What page? And again, this is twenty six at the very. This is bottom. this is this is the soft cover, right? Yeah, yeah. So again, this is from Rand's perspective. And you've already been told that Rand is head and shoulders taller than her fa- his father and the tallest guy in the village. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now he, the original as forum it, boards and, and the conversations and interviews with Jordan put, it, put him somewhere around six foot six to six foot eight. He's yeah. massive, especially for a time period like this. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and yeah. side note, Lan is supposed to be pretty damn close to as tall. So he was put at like six foot five ish in the, uh, the best guesstimates based on interviews and, and fan theories. And Perrin was right. supposed to be almost as tall as land. Yeah. Matt would be about my height right at six foot. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah. So back to your. So Rand is um, looming over this diminutive woman. Mm-hmm. And yet she was barely tall enough to come up to his chest. But her presence was such that her height seemed the proper one, and he felt ungainly for his tallness. Mm-hmm. Now, this, this is tall, something you can see that it, shy, tall man stoop too. If you know what yes. I'm talking about, if you have yes. the tall friend that's kind of a shy dude, notice how much shorter than they look than how they actually are. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I went to Japan a couple of times for study abroad, and I felt like Godzilla, and I, I felt. I felt awkward and like, you know, sticking out like I just hit my thumb with a hammer. So uh, it's, it's very easy to self-identify. Uh, so th- those were my big takeaway. That was my big takeaway from chapter two there. Uh, do you have any other thoughts? No, I think, I think the, the most important thing is that slow build. And chapter two mm-hmm. was about the strangers, which would be Moiraine and Lan. Yes. Uh, now, Lan, they didn't go into as much just because he was, well, they, they confused him for the Dark Rider. 
at one point that yeah. was kind of yeah. important because that that gives you the impression about how dangerous he looks because yes. he looks like the bad guy that scares him as well he's he's dressed in darker clothes he rides a black horse He's very menacing looking. He mm-hmm. he does not have a friendly face. No, he's, he's, he, he doesn't even try to have a friendly face. And, yeah. And, and, and even for people who are not martially trained, so they don't. Uh, so something that drives you and me crazy when we watch action movies is because since we've trained in various martial arts, we can tell when it looks slow and crappy, mm-hmm. you know, so uh if if you've done any amount of training and you see some bad choreography boy does it stand out and and so so i saw a meme that this is semi-related because i think both of us are good at physics uh and it it was uh when you learn a lot of physics wait wait, bad things about learning in physics it's got a lot of math and it ruins every action movie (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh, but no, what I was going to say is, is you can you can tell when it, when an actor or an actress moves in a way that is is graceful and or lethal. Mm-hmm. If they've had so, you can tell if they've had some training. But even but there are those who even to the untrained eye they move in such a way that they seem like a badass. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's and, what and, Lan is. And to take, uh, to, to borrow from Eastern cinematography in the 80s, 90s, and uh, well, 70s, 80s, 90s, what you need when you do these mystical things in combat is you need to establish the mysticism first. This person can do this thing where they do a flip kick, but end up going back into their original stance without you know gravity pulling them to the ground mm-hmm. needs to be established first a la crouching tiger hidden dragon where there was a mystical as- aspect to it but it was it was clear it wasn't it wasn't this person just did this and so that that's kind of i think partly where you kind of went with that where, where this was something that need well, well the mystery with the writer with the cloak yes. and everything is going to be made clear later but lan himself you get an impression about him that he can do things that normal people can't yeah with with, with the way that just the way forget, he walks you, he's standing they, they, there and you don't even know how much uh, through all the books how much time does robert jordan spend talking about how the way people walk yeah uh, you know a, a good example of what i'm talking about here uh jean-claude van damme Okay. He had a little bit, as I understand his background from what I've read and heard, he had a little bit of training in Savat, but mostly his background was ballet, dance, gymnastics. Mm -hmm. So he was able to move in a way that fooled you because he had such control over his body. Mm -hmm. He had, he had such physical strength and control that he moved in a way that even the untrained eye said, whoa, what's that? And, well, and, and, and so, he was a physical specimen to give mm-hmm. him the credit. You know, he, he, the splits on the chair and all that. People don't realize how much stress is on the medial knee at that point. Uh, all right. So jumping into the third chapter. Yeah. A couple things that jumped out at me here. Um, so you get, you get Perrin's introduction, and and he's a he's a third leg of the stool here. So he, here's the third friend. Uh, he has a different look to him. He's very tall, but he doesn't seem as tall because he's so broad. You it very quickly establishes that he's the gentle giant. That there's a crowd of people, and he's moving very carefully because he doesn't want to squish anyone. Um, uh, and, and he he has a a different demeanor to rand and matt he's the he's the the thinker Mm -hmm. okay so he he's he's gonna ponder before he speaks sorry you Uh, you just brought up things through before you just brought up uh van dam and the way he moved that wasn't just right so this is the first thing that came to mind uh guy's a freak does he have a youtube channel he looks like someone i used to watch yeah, on Ju- juji mufu 
Okay. This this is not even the most impressive thing that he does. But wow. You want a freak of nature? Look him up. Get him on Instagram. He's always posting videos. But uh, yeah, that, that the Van Dam thing made me think of him just because <laughs> he's doing the splits. I think he got on America's Got Talent and he did the split on the chair with Heidi Klum over his head. I wish I could do the splits now. Okay. Yeah. So, but the first, the first important thing that really jumps out at me here is partly because it's such a contrast with the show, um, but also on page 35, you get the first mention of the dragon with, you know, capital D. So this is something or someone important that also has deep roots in the psyche of this world okay and again he, it's showing not telling so you uh you immediately get a freak out from the crowd and you get this scene where you don't know who's saying you get all these quotes that aren't attributed to anyone because it's just people shouting about the dragon and it's it's conflicting things everything is a little bit different some things 180 degrees different so you get a whole crowd of people you mention this name and all of a sudden people are freaking out and there's all this shouting going on so you know immediately without jordan telling you without jordan telling you the way that we talked about when we were talking about the series of what the dragon is and why it was so such a big effing deal and a big departure mm -hmm. for Moiraine to simply say in that first or second episode, one of you is the dragon and you have to come with me. Mm -hmm. No, you don't just say that here. Um, this is what happens. So he doesn't have to give you a bunch of exposition of the background of who or what the dragon is. You get a great idea just from this scene. Mm -hmm. Uh especially if you get that idea where, where we get the disconnect is when you know exactly what it means for someone to be the dragon. If you were to tell a group of kids from this area that one of you is the dragon, they're going to start looking at each other. Like Matt started looking at everybody when he had the dagger mm. because Holy crap, which one of us is it? It ain't me. Cause I would know it, right? It ain't me. So it's one of you. And one of you is the most evil person. One of you is the Antichrist. One of you is a monster. Yeah. You know, what, what, what kind of monster is a little uncertain and we don't know, but we know you're a monster. But there's either that or you have the whole group of them saying, okay, now we know you're crazy. We're leaving. And mm -hmm. you, you, one, of the, one of the two, because as bad as it was to even have the idea that the dragon was reborn at that time, the idea, even they thought they were removed because it was talking about the war in Gelden. They thought they were mm. removed from it and it still got that reaction versus yes. a group of kids with children's tales being told one of you is. I mean, first of all, somebody in the group would have shit their pants. Uh, mm. But other than that, I mean, it, it would have either created a hyper paranoid situation or a, okay, Moraine, you saved our village kind of ish, but we got to peace out because you're crazy. Mm. Well, at, as you get some of the shouting here, the dragon broke the world, didn't he? He started it. He caused the time of madness, capital letters. So hold on. There's another thing that jumps out at you that Jordan's not explaining yet, but he's showing you this is something important. This is something that has scarred the psyche of this entire world. So what is this? Uh, you know the prophecies. When the dragon is reborn, your worst nightmares will seem like your fondest dream. He's just another false dragon. He must be. So, again, another false dragon. He's he's giving you clues. With He's showing you without telling you. And he's planting all of these seeds. The The, the other thing that, that really jumped out at me, this whole scene with Thane is so great because <clears throat> it sets the stage of the world. OK, there there are no newspapers. There is no Internet. Things are far away. And so much of the world is uncertain. So 
Fane isn't just giving you exposition. He's telling a story. So not only do you get this, the, the vainness of Fane's character, but then he shows you that vainness in the way he's kind of preening and telling a story and embellishing and being happy to be the center of attention. Mm-hmm. But which, the other which, thing it shows you, everything is, yeah. 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 So I actually got that impression of him in the series. And mm-hmm. I actually liked that portrayal right in the beginning. And then they just screwed it up after that. But then, yeah, I got yeah. that impression of him in the beginning. And I wish they would have actually played that a little bit more yeah. in the show. Okay. So but now part two. The, the other thing that just completely not only goes away, they never, they never look at it all is this, this point that, so much of the information in the world is pure speculation or just plain rumor. Nothing is certain. And right now, and for a long time, the reader is no more informed than the characters. Mm -hmm. And that's a major part of the story, both plot wise and the construction of the story. Okay, then you get a little more world building here uh, as Fane is led off by the council and the crowd breaks mm-hmm. up and now our main characters, the three boys and we we meet Egwene. So she's brought into the group here and you get you get the scene with the three boys talking together, speculating on what they've heard. And Matt, I heard a story once, Matt said slowly, from a wool buyer's guard. At what page? He said the dragon would be bored. Uh, this is 39 near the bottom. Okay. So this is this is them. They've been talking for a little bit here about uh, what's going on, speculating about what all this means. And, and then towards to, the end of this conversation. They're trying to speculate about what the conversation is with the council and yeah they're they're speculating on what's going on in the in the end with the council talking to pat and fane uh speculating on what's going to happen when the Aes Sedai get there to confront this false dragon is he a false dragon blah 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 and now you get the first the first instance of a wrinkle in this story i heard a story once matt said slowly from a wool buyer's guard he said the dragon would be reborn in mankind's greatest hour of need and save us all. Well, he was a fool if he believed that, Perrin said firmly, and you were a fool to listen. He did not sound angry. He was slow to anger, but he sometimes got exasperated with Matt's quicksilver fancies, and there was a touch of that in his voice. I suppose he claimed we'd all live in a new age of legends afterwards, too. I didn't say I believed it, Matt protested. I just heard it, and Eve did, too, and I thought she was going to skim me and the guard both. He said, the guard did, that a lot of people do believe, only they're afraid to say so, afraid of the Aes Sedai or the Children of the Light. He wouldn't say any more after Nynaeve lit into us. She told the merchant, and he said it was the guard's last trip with it. So you get another wrinkle here. And again, it's more than just simple exposition because you've got this conversation slash arguments between the boys. And so you're getting more of their character, you know. Matt's got this kind of crazy gleam in his eye and he thinks this is all fun and exciting. Mm -hmm. Perrin's Perrin doesn't like, uh, you know, is the one who eventually gets annoyed with Matt's, you know, prankster boyish nature because he's a little more serious and a little more thoughtful. Uh, You also get, you, we've heard about Nynaeve and we're about to meet her. And you get more of it here, of her of her temper and the way she scares even full-grown men. Well, and it also tells you a little bit about how seriously they take it all. It's, it is still just children's tales. It is, they're uh-huh. adult enough to know, well, our parents were just trying to scare us into doing good. Yeah. But you, yeah, no, you no, get a not. couple of mentions of that here already from some of the other youngsters uh, about the Forsaken and the the... You know, the the um, Grimm's fairy tales. Uh, if you go back and you you read some of the original Grimm's or other fairy tales, um, they're pretty dark mm-hmm. uh, because they were used. The 
the mechanism of a children's tale was used to teach a serious lesson. And so that's the same thing that's happening here with the dragon, with the forsaken. These are, these are the stories you tell your children to scare them straight, basically. Well, it also gives you an impression of what they think about the Aes Sedai as well. Mm -hmm. They've got these stories and they're, they're speculating on the nature of what they are as well. So to have, again, you don't just come in and say, I am this, respect me like they did in the show. It's this progression of, we think this about this certain group of people. Do you think this lady might be this? Mm -hmm. But no, she's just a lady. Uh, they're, they're speculating from stories. And when they come across something that they haven't ever come across, which is a person dress, dressed as fancy as her, they, they bring those two things together that shows kind of their innocence and it shows how isolated the place they are is. And that's, that's a great point because it leads straight into the next chapter because chapter four is the Gleeman. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is something that is, is, is Tom is great for. That's why he's such a great character mm -hmm. because he knows the truth from the story because he's a, a very worldly and wise person and he's been mm -hmm. around the block a few times and you don't know that yet. You, you, you don't know why. Let me rephrase that. You, you know, from his first meeting, there is something more to Tom than meets the eye. He is not just a simple traveling storyteller. Uh, Jordan makes that very clear without saying it, mm -hmm. right? He, he says it without saying it, which is great. So, very quickly, you know, Tom is something more than he seems, but he's also a storyteller. So he still tells these stories and, and that's, and that's in some of his banter with the, with the youngsters of, of talking about these stories. And, <clears throat> and so you get more of the world from the world's perspective, because most of the world is going to know these things from the idea that Columbus proved the world is round is silly. Mm -hmm. He may have proven that popularly um, because it, it may be that a lot of uneducated normal folk still thought that. And now we've proven, you know, to everyone, but the learned of the world knew since the time of ancient Greece, when, uh, I think it was Ptolemy. I'm drawing a blank here. I can't remember who proved it mathematically. Somebody using shadows and angles and geometry not only showed that the world was round, but gave a mathematical equation on how big the world was. He wasn't right, but he was actually surprisingly close given mm -hmm. the level of technology of the time. So, you know, Tom, Tom is, is one of those people. He, he knows a lot of the truth, even if he doesn't know everything, because it's too hard to know everything, but he knows a lot of the truth. But so, so you get glimpses of that from, from him and you don't get his perspective yet, but you get him talking. And so you do get, you do get hints of the truth, but then he's still telling the stories. Um, it, when I think he, some, he's also, in, Tom brings something else important that Jordan did uh, in this chapter is with the of course they they're, they're all around him they're requesting the stories and everything he introduced important concepts for later by using mm -hmm. uh kind of similar names and uh, where you can you can connect it to what we know from stories you know uh arthur pendrag uh as arthur hawkwing so we could we, you, you automatically you you just mentally associate him with uh king arthur you know yeah. and which he's going to be really important when we talk shanchen because i can't believe we have the shanchen coming into the show with no ever mention of even a story of arthur hawkwing yeah. because mm -hmm. that's kind of the point uh, big effing deal a big effing deal yeah you know uh anla the wise counselor you all mm -hmm. of these things all these stories that you can bring uh El elsbeth wait is that you know, is that yeah. Queen Elizabeth? What's that? Mosque. Is that referring to? So what he does know? is he interjects a thought in your mind of how these things are supposed to be. So he doesn't have to explain 
a lot of things down the road. And then so, when it comes back up, you already have this idea in your head. The the very opening, I don't I can't believe I skipped over this, but after you read 14 books, it becomes pretty it becomes background. It becomes like the the scroll on Star Wars, and yet each one's a little bit different. But uh, we should have mentioned the very opening of the book of chapter one, the wheel of time turns and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades into myth and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Mm-hmm. Every book starts like that. And that opening, that opening paragraph is just a little bit different based on what's going on there. But he gave you that in poetic language at the very beginning. And now he's showing you that. Mm-hmm. Because you're thinking, wait a minute, are these referring to things that I know, whether consciously or unconsciously, you're thinking you're connecting these dots, Arthur Hawking to Archer Payne Drag, King Arthur, mm-hmm. uh, to tell Elsbeth, us about Elizabeth, Glenn, how he flew to the moon on the belly of an eagle, John Glenn in as an astronaut, you know, all of these things that you mm-hmm. can you can immediately kind of get a picture in your head without it actually yeah. being that same thing. Uh, right so he's he's reinforcing this idea that that one this is actually our world just mm -hmm. in the very far future or very far past depending on how you look at it they tried to do in the show because if you didn't notice some of those backdrops were like broken down skyscrapers with with plants all over them and oh no i missed that i'm gonna have to go find some stills of that because i could I, i could use a good angry right now anyway um but so so not not only is he is he pulling you more into this world by by showing you that this is our world just in the far future far past um but but he's also showing you that every myth has a kernel of truth Mm -hmm. so now go back to what we were just saw with that back and forth between Thane and the crowd and between the boys talking about it. Where's the kernel of truth? Mm -hmm. Because he's showing you so consciously or unconsciously, he's pulling you back to what he just told you and making you think what's the kernel of truth in here. So he's laying, he's planting all these seeds. He's laying this foundation for this very complex thing that he's starting to build. All right. And speaking of building, we get more building here. So he's already just last chapter. He he introduced Moraine, and now we're going to build off of Moraine, and we're going to use Moraine to build on Tom still. So you get this you get this great tension where where Tom is giving this mini performance. He's giving this teaser to to a small crowd, and then all of a sudden Moraine shows up, and it stops, and something's going on there, and we don't know why and we're not going to find out why for a while um but it's it's reinforcing that both of these people are more than they seem Mm -hmm. even though from rand's perspective who you're seeing this from he just figures that the the traveling storyteller the gleeman isn't happy to not be the center of attention anymore and but jordan makes it pretty clear that's not what's going on here. There's something more. You don't know what, but there's something more here. Mm-hmm. Well, how much do we want to bounce around from the series to the books? You know, where where appropriate, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it. Like well, I said, especially this, since this we was had one of my this was one of my beefs is why of why Tom was so important at this point. Because it would have allowed yeah. it would have allowed for so much character development, uh, all uh, in the beginning, without a whole lot of extra screen time. Uh, and not only, I mean, yeah, granted, you would have had to push the two rivers battle till the second episode, probably, to include all of that, and you would have probably had a very docile first episode. And, and I know that today's attention span doesn't call for that, but the you know, many millions of book fans would have much more appreciated that uh, because we're, we're on chapter, what, four? Yeah, we're, four. we're finishing and, up chapter four here. And you're still kind of meeting people. Mm-hmm. Nothing has actually happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. You've got the, 
you've got those brief glimpses of action with with the prologue and then with you know that suspense of seeing the black rider and then he disappears and what's going on here but for the most part you're still setting the scene and it's going to pay off later mm-hmm. and it's actually going to pay off a lot quicker than you think mm-hmm. uh as we did you have any more thoughts on that uh well the other the other part with the scene with uh with tom in there was that you got a lot more descriptors of the characters because he's describing rand when he's talking about we can do this for a trick where you can't hold me up or or Mm-hmm. Uh, as someone as well muscled as Perrin and he describes him a little yeah. bit more so he he actually goes a little bit more into how tall Rand is how extremely muscular Perrin is uh and that kind of is important again one of the beefs is with the current Perrin in the series is this guy better be buff under what the clothes they've been putting on him because he yeah he's you know a little bit tall but that's it uh, the, the way they just the, the way they describe Perrin in these books you I'm thinking old school Conan the Barbarian characters, you know, mm-hmm. bodybuilders turned into actors. Uh, you know, I, maybe- think, I think the way I described him in our last, one of our last uh, episodes on the series was he's like a, uh, he's like a, a, a young strongman competitor. Mm-hmm. So, so think about those guys from Iceland, Scandinavia, the way those guys look. Uh, and to me, that's, that's Perrin. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of a younger actor that has that kind of build nowadays. You don't see him. You don't see him very Wasn't often. Wasn't there a guy because... in the, uh, who do you play? He played Juggernaut in the, uh, not Juggernaut, uh, po- Power Man in the, the Deadpool show. He was a younger guy, but he was real big and jacked because he was one of the younger X-Men. Was it one of the newer movies? Because I didn't watch the one. I think it was the second Deadpool movie where he was teaming up with the those young X Men about halfway through the show. Oh well, they, there was they ended up fighting. Colossus Juggernaut. was in there. Colossus, yeah, Col- yeah, yeah, yeah. Colossus, yeah. So someone like well, that. He's, I, a, he's a younger actor, but he's just this massively giant. I don't remember them ever showing dude. Colossus not in steel mode. So, but still, it was the same I, actor. I, I you don't know you, what he looks. The same yeah, build. so I don't know what he yeah. looks like. I don't know what he looks. I did. I did, so I didn't know that he was a younger actor. Um, well, the, the whole, uh, or the, the, whole uh, group, the whole group was teens. That whole group that uh, Deadpool was working mm-hmm. with was teens, late teens. Uh, I, I I don't know if he can act, and he's got an accent. But uh, did you watch the second Creed movie? Uh, with I did. Dolph Lundgren, and that was like a I did not. Rocky Three reboot. Um, the 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 actor who played Dolph Lundgren's son. I'm pretty sure he's an actual boxer. I think he's Polish. Um, and and he has a good look for it. If you want to know what Perrin's supposed to look like, what I think of, uh, that's a newer thing that someone might have seen um, for 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 his size uh, and, and his look. Uh, and that, that's kind of the look that I see when I read, when I've read the books and I, you know, have this mental image in my own head. But that's that's a good point about something oh. Jordan does so well is giving you multiple points of characterization, even though you're only seeing a scene from one character's point of view. Is, is that him? Yeah. 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 That would be that would be quite. I mean, obviously, if he can do a, a, a nice face as well as that angry face. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause, cause that you know, he if he could do the angry face when he goes into to wolf mode. Yeah, you know, that's, but if he can do a that's happy that's his I that must too. break you face. Yeah, if he can do a happy face too, I then yeah, that would be great. Yeah, but yeah, the build. Yeah. I mean, he's he's supposed to be a very well muscled, but in a good looking way. When you said power lifter, you, you know, I'm thinking big belly and all of that. Uh, yeah, but, no, it, no, but in so, a good looking so, way. It seems like all the American ones are, but the Scandinavian guys tend to be, you know, a little, a little to a lot trimmer. Uh, like the mountain is a lot trimmer than a lot of the American guys. Like what was the big black guy that, that went to the WWE? Um, uh, crap. I'm brain farting his name. Um, I was reading an interview. This is completely random. I think it was with the undertaker. 
uh, asking about the strongest guy in the ring. And it was Mark something or other. And he said, well, we were at this place one time and this car had blocked our bus in and we were trying to get to the, the arena. And this guy just walked out, picked the car up by one end and dragged it out of the way. So, yeah, that's a big dude. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Uh, so uh, you, you'd mentioned that not a lot has happened yet, but here we are. Uh, chapter what is winter night chapter five and things are about to hit the fan the, as our as our high school calculus teacher like to say the fecal matter is about to strike the rotating blades <laughs> oh i miss mr Galky. yeah good stuff um this is actually so when i was thinking cinematically in my head this is actually where i would end the first episode because i think I think from here to Byerlawn, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't mind skipping Byerlawn if you're going to introduce men somewhere else. I don't like waiting so long to introduce her, mm -hmm. but I could see skipping that to, to move things along faster. But from here to Byerlawn happens very fast, even mm -hmm. though it's a lot of chapters, a lot of words, it's a lot of action. And so things are moving very quickly. So you can cover a lot of ground in a second episode. And you take that first episode to set the stage. And to me, the ending of the first, the perfect ending to the first episode is the Trolloc breaking in the door because you leave the audience with an oh shit moment as the, yeah, as okay, the door so splinters and comes and then you, you cut, you cut to credits. I was going to say something else, but you actually might have the better one here. I was going to say him and Tam just going home. Mm -hmm. And leave it in the suspense of that. Maybe show something running by the window or something like that. You show the Black Rider again, way or, back. Or show, or show, or show shows you know the Black Rider again, or or something in the background. Or just shows it, and just show uh, Cam getting the sword yeah. out from under the bed. Mm. And and Perrin, or not Perrin, uh, Rand, just being like, "What's that?" Just thought we'd need it, son, and then fade to black. Yeah. Um, but you here in this, here in this chapter, the, the, the first several pages of this chapter that where everything, where the fecal matter is about to hit the rotating blades. And again, Jordan's kind of lulling you to sleep with, with, uh, with, from Rand's perspective, Rand going through the farm chores for anyone who's ever lived on or worked on or has relatives that, yeah had a farm and back in the day kid, before you had central heat like and this. air you had to cut the wood before you had a fire before you could cook <laughs> the food before you could keep the place warm uh and, and and i you know i love the part about the this is supposed to be a festival this was supposed to be a day of, of rest and but they came back even though they weren't necessarily planning on it and now there are chores to do because on a farm there's always chores to do which is absolutely true um and so you you get you get he Jordan's resets this idyllic pastoral scene right before he kills everything, uh, kind of literally, <laughs> poor sheep. Um, but that that's where I would have ended the very first episode is with the Trolloc breaking through the door, splintering it, and oh crap, what is this? And it is one of the. Um, the few things I really liked about uh, the series, especially those first few episodes, is you do actually get to see, holy crap, Tam isn't just a farmer. Mm -hmm. He's 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 taking things apart. And in the in the in the book, you get that too, as he cuts this thing down and then he throws his shoulder under this big honking oak table and throws it uh, to mm -hmm. block the door. Um, so you get some great imagery in the book there too. Well, you know, I like, and the you're actor still not they, told why and how I like the actor they got for Tam, uh, mm -hmm. but you know who I always pictured because of the way they describe him in the books is, do you remember in the movie gladiator, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the head yeah, yeah, yeah. gladiator, the yeah. thick, the thick, broad guy He's, that, that the, that's the, the guy that who fatherly, buys him when he's yeah, yeah. The, that's got that fatherly aspect to him, but you know, he's badass because he's the only gladiator to ever win his freedom 
and all that. That's the guy I actually pictured. That was the face in my head every time he came up. That he's just this 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 stout, badass dude, but comes across as a father. Mm -hmm. But but and then that would have fit better in the scene you're describing too, where he just it, it just all came out at once but uh yeah and 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 he's he's described as having more white and gray than than black in his hair so Mm -hmm. you know the 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 look was good uh for that guy it would also made a good contrast because he was kind of a shorter guy Mm -hmm. and the actor they got for rand he's tall but he's not super tall so it Mm -hmm. would have made him loom over a little bit more and and made it made it yeah. uh, and you could have you could have done that with the other actors in the village too just have slightly yeah. shorter people to make Perrin look bigger to make Matt look bigger because Matt was not nearly Perrin or Rand but he was taller than average yeah uh, so you could you could have kind of given them a little bigger than life look compared to the other villagers just yep. with your casting of the other villagers and and you know not to get not to get too far ahead cuz we are talking about the book here but it's not just the physical ideal of what a hero is supposed to look like. Jordan is setting something up here by pointing out how odd Rand looks, by pointing out how much he stands out. You know, not his 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 size significantly more than everybody else, and and his his red hair and gray eyes. He really stands out amongst the two rivers, folks. He's Jordan is setting something up here. Um, and that's, we, we've, we've been going for about an hour here. And since that's kind of my, this is where I would put it at a, at a, at the end of an episode one, I think that's a good point to stop it here. Mm-hmm. And we'll pick up here uh, next time going through, you know, the rest of what happens. Uh, okay. So do we want to call this one through whatnot. five, or are we going to continue with five? Call, call it one through five, and next time we'll call it five through whatever, um, because we do get into a little bit of chapter five of what happens here, because mm-hmm. uh, that is a, that is a, I mean, you kind of, you, you know, something's going to happen as a reader, just from a meta point of view, but it is a great scene and a great reveal of all you've seen so far is this one writer dressed in black, and there's something supernatural here, because his it's a very windy day and his cloak's not moving. But then all of a sudden the door busts in. And I love the way Jordan writes it. He writes it slow with, with, with Rand looking and, oh good. It's just a big, you know, guy, you know? So like part of Rand's mind is like, something's wrong here. Cause someone just, someone just broke open the door, but then he slowly realizes this isn't a human holy crap and he's Mm -hmm. scared spitless right so it's it's a great reveal there of of throwing the reader not only into action but even deeper into the the fantasy supernatural part of this Mm -hmm. all right good place to stop yeah we're just over an hour so this is one of our more brief talks Um, and i i I think th- I, I think the next uh, episode for sure will go faster because, like I said, the the subsequent chapters are more action oriented and more mm-hmm. movement, and so they do go a lot faster. These first few chapters were so important to me, and so much jumped out at me of, wow, I didn't I did not notice before how much Jordan was laying a foundation and foreshadowing things Mm -hmm. that that are going to take a long time to unravel but he's 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 planting those seeds in you well yeah and as we go forward especially revolving around eridol shadow logoth the the importance of what is planted in those chapters can't be Mm. uh can't be downplayed yeah you know, it, it seems like a cool moment at the time when you're reading it, but then when you realize how important it is, it's it it it, it changes the whole world in about seven or eight books. Uh, mm-hmm. So so yeah, the, the, it, yeah, you say it goes fast and it does, but I think I think we do need to key in on some of those things that yeah. we need to say. You need to remember this. 
Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully next episode will take us from the two rivers all the way to Arid Hole, but we'll see. We'll see how quick we go. Well, Bar- Barrelin will be pretty quick, except for we do need to key in on men a little bit just because of how important yep. she is. But yep, yep, yep. but that, that section will be pretty quick. And then the, the transfer from that is to, 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 to the other is, is pretty quick as well. Mm-hmm. But we do, I guess, introduce, reintroduce Nynaeve again. So. Yep, All right. yep, yep. All right. We'll, we'll see you all time. next time with more of this.